Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to all of you at home. I have been on Facebook as our opening song was playing. So I know that there are many of you out there that are liking the video and c continuing to comment. So please do so, so that we know that you are with us as we continue to worship this morning. I am Pastor Emily, one of the pastors here at First Lutheran Church. And I want to welcome you all, whether you are on Facebook or you are here present with us in this building. It is great. It is a great day to worship today. Um, I have two things I want to bring to your attention, the first of which you're probably already aware of. We have a guest pianist today, Chris Shepard, and we want to welcome you today. What wonderful music to begin our worship service, and we look forward to more throughout the remainder of our service. And the second is we have Jeff Zill once again that is going to help lead our worship today and bring us a word from the Gospels. So I want to welcome Jeff to, uh, up to the altar. He's one of our members. He's been commissioned by the North Carolina Synod as a lay preacher, and he is in seminary. So we welcome Jeff up here today. As we prepare for worship, please stand. Let us together give thanksgiving for our baptism. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our Creator, Lord, and Companion. Amen. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your Spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world calling forth life in which you take delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, Jesus was baptized by John and drenched with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, calling us heirs of your promise, and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. you.
let us pray together the prayer of the day located in your bulletin and on your screens. Merciful and loving God, your perfect love and grace open our eyes to see people's deepest needs, calling for each of us to share your grace and love with one another. Guide our actions, thoughts, and generosity as we navigate with you and one another through fulfilling the needs of our world in sharing our anxieties and our love, our poverty and prosperity. May we know your presence, be filled with your love, and be touched by the power of your spirit, that we may minister your mercy with joy and your love with gladness. Amen. Please be seated. At this point in our service, we look to our younger ones that are with us worshiping at home. And I have a big question for our kids this morning. As we look into our scripture message today, we're going to be looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. One of the hurtful things for us uh, right now is that we're not back uh, together again as a group. But one of the blessings that I have been touched by, by our children here at First Lutheran, is to be active in the faith formation program. And when we look on Sundays and look at the Good Samaritan parable each time, the joy in the kids' faces when I ask them, who is your neighbor? I'm going to do something a little unprecedented that Pastor Jay and Pastor Emily have not done during a children's sermon yet. And I'd like to ask our children to get interactive with the chat bar and the Facebook today. And with the help of an adult or parent, I want to ask each and every one of you, who do you think your neighbor is? And I'd like to see a response throughout the service this morning. One of the joys that I always get is there's always that one child in the back that's always quiet throughout faith formation. And that response that comes, everybody, everybody, <laughs> always a joy to hear that. But children, as we look into the scripture this morning, as you are familiar with this parable that we so often discover, is that there's a situation where Jesus and a lawyer are kind of having a back and forth question and answer session about who their neighbor think who they think their neighbor is and the parable in summary goes pretty short in the fact that there's a man wounded on the side of the road and three main characters enter into the story outside of this wounded man the first kind of sees the wounded man turns his head and runs the other way the second man does the same as the first but believe it or not, the Samaritan stops and helps the man and shows his love and mercy on the man there wounded there on the highway side of the road. So as we look into this story today, I want you to think about, I know we have had some back and forth over the last year and a half between being in school at home via a computer or being home in person as we get back into full-time school this fall, you will be fully acting and, 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 and engaging with teachers and other students within your school. And with this question of who is your neighbor, I just want you to think about the one child, or there may be many, that are new to the school, that don't know anyone, that don't have any friends. The one child that sits in the corner and doesn't react or socialize with anyone. And maybe you're sitting down at lunch and you realize the person sitting next to you doesn't have any food to eat or very little. Think about those situations that you encounter and how you can be a good neighbor to those that you meet. Let us pray together this morning. Gracious God, Thank you for the message of love and mercy that you give us and remind us that we are light and love through Jesus to this world in need. 
May we be good neighbors to those that we encounter and share your love and light to everyone. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you this morning, children. I hope you all have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Today's lesson is from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. And the Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing the, his commandments, and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should stay. say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Here ends the lesson. Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to himself, to him, you have been given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <clears throat> Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these 
three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The good news of God for all people. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. In today's reading, Jesus is tested by a lawyer. It's difficult to tell from the exchange if the lawyer is being condescending or sarcastic towards Jesus. A series of questions follow throughout the exchange. The first question the lawyer asks Jesus is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds with the question, what is written in the law? Jesus then proceeds with an even more personal question. How do you read it? Being versed in the law, the lawyer knows what is written and the rules of everyday life. This expert in the law responds by quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, when Moses tells the Israelites, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Accompanied with this response, the lawyer also quotes Leviticus 19, 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against any one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. This expert in the law correctly understood that the law demanded total devotion to God and love for one's neighbor. I believe we can remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, when the religious teachers asked the question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. As we look further into today's text, Jesus confirms the lawyer's response and tells him, do this and you shall live. The lawyer then asked Jesus to clarify what he meant when he said that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Now Jesus could have replied with a lecture, but instead in typical Jesus form, he replies with a parable. I believe we all know this parable on some level. The image is common enough for the hearer. A man's lying half dead in a ditch along the side of the road. Three people are introduced into the scene, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. The priest sees the man, moves to the other side of the road, and quickly walks away. The Levite, not far behind the priest, does the same exact thing. The Samaritan, on the other hand, took pity on the wounded and hurting man, bandaged his wounds, transports him to an inn to take care of him. The Samaritan goes even as far as to pay the innkeeper to look after the wounded man and promises to reimburse the innkeeper for any additional costs when he returns. I'd like to just peek into the background of this story that is not apparent or obvious throughout this text. There was a deep hatred between Samaritans and Jews. There was no love relationship between these two groups of people. Jews and Samaritans viewed one another as enemies. Each worshiped God differently, carried different traditions and customs. Each group did its best to avoid the other. If a movie was cast during the time in Jesus' earthly ministry, the Samaritans would be cast as the villains. Casting a Samaritan as a hero would be unheard of, except for Jesus. One thing that struck me the most from this week's reading 
is the Samaritan does not appear to ask a single question. He did not question the man before he jumped in to help him. He showed mercy and compassion and cared for this wounded man. I, being like the lawyer this week, continually ask myself, who is this wounded man? I cannot see anywhere in today's text or the surrounding text that tells me who he is. I believe we can speculate or guess that the man could have been Samaritan. If he was a Samaritan, that would make sense. The Samaritan's caring for his own people. If the man was Jewish, if he was, shouldn't the Samaritan have followed in the steps of the priest and the Levite? Or maybe it was an Ethiopian eunuch, a foreigner. Regardless of what we assume as the identity of the individual, we're left with no clues to guide us. All we know is the man is wounded, left for dead. Jesus does not give us any more details than this. Was Jesus being purposeful in these lack of details? I'm guessing the first question the priests and the Levite most likely asked themselves was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But through mercy, love, and deep concern, the good Samaritan reversed the question and asked, if I do not help this man, what will happen to him? The world we live in often seeks to take the first question. If I stop to help, what will happen to me? When the question should be, if I do not stop to help, what will happen to them? We're embroiled in the fight between these two questions today. With the pandemic looming and the resurgence of COVID and fighting over vaccinations and required face masks, we should not be asking, if I stop to help, what will happen to me? But ask the question, if we do not stop to help, what will happen to them? The vulnerable need our help. The fight to keep them and our children safe is not over. We see the same situation in the cry from people of color screaming for help. Racism, discrimination, and death are plaguing our brothers and sisters of color. We should not be asking the question, if I stop to help, what will happen to me? But ask the question, if I do not stop to help, what will happen to them? Our brothers and sisters of color need our help. The fight against racism and discrimination is not over. Our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community are crying out against the same discrimination and hate that they're experiencing in their lives. We should not be asking the question, if I stop to help, what will happen to me? But ask the question, if I do not stop to help, what will happen to them? Our brothers and sisters in the LGB community need our help. The fight for equality is not over. Those struggling in our own communities for their next meal, a safe place to live and sleep, need our help. We should not be asking the question, if I stop to help, what will happen to me? But ask the question, if I do not stop to help, what will happen to them? Our fight against hunger and homelessness is far from over. I believe we can learn from Jesus' example of caring for those in need, especially those who were marginalized in their first century Jewish, set, Jewish setting. In turn, we today should reach out to those in need within our society and fight for the marginalized, both in and out of our circles. I often feel we forget to remember that we are all children of God. Regardless of where we grew up, 
regardless of the language we speak, our skin color, religious background, gender, orientation, age, each of us is a child of God who is loved, valued, and made in God's image. We need to stop dividing one another. The ugly labels and hierarchies in society need to be a distant memory. The person who votes on one side of the political aisle should not be viewed as the enemy of the opposing side. Just because I like something and you do not does not mean you and I are enemies. Regardless of our beliefs, opinions, likes, dislikes, and sense of moral obligation, in God's eyes, we are all important members of the body of Christ. Jesus communicated his life-altering expectations to the people he was reaching, but he did so after the fact that he sincerely had passion for them. The priest and the Levite walked by the man laying for dead on the side of the road. They were aware of the man's presence, which caused them to walk to the other side of the road. They did not truly see the man and his needs as a priority, or even an issue that personally affected their own lives. This is not what Jesus wants us to do. We're met with so many situations and people in our lives every day who need our help. We do not have to look very far to see a neighbor who is in need. But the Good Samaritan doesn't take care of the wounded man for the rest of his life. He tends to the man's immediate needs, gets him to a safe location to heal, to give the man an opportunity to live a normal life. I believe every person on this earth wants deeply to live a normal life. And sometimes our everyday decisions affect that outcome. One thing I've learned through my studies throughout the Gospels, Jesus never quantifies or qualifies who our neighbors are supposed to be. Jesus loved and cared for all people, including tax collectors, children, women in multiple marriages, foreigners, the sick, day laborers, Jews, Samaritans, whoever they were, wherever they happened to be, Jesus was there. He spent time with them. He listened to their stories, heard their complaints, identified with their sorrows, and asked questions to better understand and meet their needs. The Bible shows that God is interested in caring for and loving the marginalized and hurting people in our world. God's compassion for people is the center of any ministry that bears the name of Jesus. So there is hope. Being made in God's image strands the light and love of Christ in our own DNA. I believe if we look deeply into ourselves, we can find and see that love. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians on what love means. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. In today's parable, Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor 
to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. And who is your neighbor? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Ask yourself, if I do not stop to help, what will happen to them? No matter the situation, person, or circumstance, love is always the answer. Jesus tells the lawyer the answer to all his questions is that love and mercy for our neighbors. Does this historical setting really apply to us in the 21st century? Absolutely. Love and mercy should always be our motive. Jesus clearly provides us with the answer to all our questions through the parable of the Good Samaritan. Go and do likewise. In Jesus' name. Let us speak the words of the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time in our service, we receive our gifts and offering. I do want to highlight today that our 10 for Teachers program is still in full swing, which assists community schools with the much needed school supplies for this coming school year. So think about and how you can support in that endeavor. 
I also want to thank those at home who continue to support the mission and ministry at FLC, as well as those that are uh, in person with us today. But I always like to take time during each service to thank those who weekly volunteer their time, give their gifts to help support both the ministries within the community, but also through the services weekly here at First Lutheran Church. Thank you all for your partnership and your continued support through our, through our ministry. At this time, let us bring our hearts and minds to prayer. Let us pray, rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit. We offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. Loving God, give us the eyes of Jesus to see those around us who are hurting, in need of assistance, and remind us that we are called to love one another. When we lack the words to say, let our actions speak in love. Forgive us for our selfishness, for our silence, for not caring enough for those who may truly need us. Teach us to love and care for one another the way you do. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Compassionate God, help us to be ever aware of your call to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to be merciful neighbors, even when it's inconvenient, when time is short or other responsibilities loom. Help us to remember the Good Samaritan and Jesus' simple message, go and do likewise. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy, your mercy is great. great. We pray not just for our own country, but for the world. The numbers of hospitalizations from COVID are continuing to rise. As loved ones are separated from their families to fight for their lives. May we surround the grieving and the hurting and comfort them, sharing our peace with them during this challenging time. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. God of grieving, many within our church family are mourning the loss of someone in their immediate family. We pray for the family of Michael Shore and his recent passing. And we also pray for those who are grieving someone today. Surround them all with your love and bring them comfort in their days of sorrow. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. Is great. Healing God, our own community has many people dealing with illness of their own and recovery from medical procedures and sickness. We ask that you help us find ways we can love and support them through whatever they're facing. We pray for members and friends of this congregation, Howard, Rachel, Sam, Ron, Michael, Ellen, Myla, Luke, Ken, Sam, David, Ray, Julia, Charlene, Wanda, John, Grace, Edgar, Corbin, Bill, Gretchen, Susan, and Karen. Give them strength for today and courage for tomorrow. There are others we lift up by saying their names either silently or aloud. Hear us, O God, your mercy, your mercy is, great. is great. We lift these things and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us rise as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses, against us, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 worshiping with us at home today and for those worshiping with us in person today go with christ and go as christ to love and serve god's world thanks Thanks be to God. god